I'm Mario Batali of Po Restaurant in New York City, and this is my show, Molto Mario. Today we're going to deal with three different ingredients, squabs, tomatoes, and kale, the first of which is going to be the tomatoes. Tomatoes are beautiful, and you can get good tomatoes year-round. These in particular look very nice. They're plum tomatoes. They're the ones that you'll have the most success with buying out of season. There are some tomatoes being farmed in Israel and Holland right now that come to the table even in the middle of the winter and are pretty, pretty good. They're not certainly the gassed green ones that are awful and sold by the evil tomato merchants of the world. But what they are, are just nice, simple tomatoes, not quite the peak of their flavor like they would be in August, September, October, but still good nonetheless. And what we're going to do in to intensify their flavor is to oven dry them or roast them at a very low temperature overnight. Now, there are many reasons to do this. For example, the one of which would be at the end of the harvest, when you have all of a sudden, just so many tomatoes, and it looks like first frost is coming. And you want to get them all out of the, uh, out of the garden and, and even preserve them. What you do is you do what I'm about to do by drying them or roasting them on a very low temperature overnight. What you could also do is use these year-round anyway, just because they add a different flavor or a texture. They're similar in intensity of flavor to the sun-dried tomatoes that you buy from Italy or Turkey or California. The way they do the sun-dried tomatoes in Italy Turkey or California, is they'll cut them just like this, they'll season them with just a little salt maybe, and then they'll set them out on the terraces of their ceilings, or on, of their roofs, in, their, in Sicily particularly, but also in and around Rome and in and around Ischia, in uh, Amalfi, they'll just put them out there, and because their sun is so intense and their evenings are so dry, that they'll be able to just leave them out there for about a week, and they'll come to beautiful sun-dried tomatoes. This we're going to do in the comfort of our own home, and we could even do them in the winter. My wife has a beautiful garden up at her farm, and at the end of every season, we either pick all the green ones off and pickle them or make green tomato marmalade, or on the last run before we consider the first frost to run, we'll take them all off and do exactly this. Take them inside, put them in the oven, and dry them out a little bit. The first step to doing it is just cutting them in half. And you cut them in half long ways, and you leave the little stem in there, and put them on an ungreased sheet pan. You don't need to grease it because you're going at such a low temperature. They're not going to stick. If they do stick just a little bit, it, wouldn't be a, it won't be a problem to get them out. So all we do is have them. I've got them all just about done. And then what I'm going to do is sprinkle them with a little sugar and salt. Now that's basically just seasoning them to get them to taste good. That's not salt enough to be actually preserving them. At, after they've been cooked, if you want to put them, and that's due in a large, to a large extent to the sugar and content in it. But it's also got something to do with the way their seeds develop. Anyway, we've got these sprinkled. We've got our oven set on about uh, 150 degrees. And we're going to put them in, and we'll let them, let them roast or slowly cook overnight for about eight hours. And, well, we've got one of those amazing ovens, and this is what they end up looking like. This is eight hours later. You can see... They've lost more than half their size, more than half their volume, and they've started to dry up and look just like the sun-dried tomatoes you pay a lot of money for in the stores. Now, the ones that are dried out more will be more intensely sweet, and uh, the ones that are dried out less will have a little more of the natural juices. In the dishes that we're going to make today, all of these are equally valid. If you wanted to preserve these by putting them in olive oil and letting them stay in a cool place in your cellar, you'd want to use the more dried out ones. The more liquid it has in something that you're trying to preserve or try to cure in a very simple way like that, which would be just packing them in oil, the more liquid you have, the more opportunity there is for it to go bad. So we'll just dry these out. Anyway, these are going to be the main ingredient in a pasta that we're going to start up in a few minutes. So when we come back, we're going to use our oven-dried tomatoes for a great pasta dish. So please stay tuned. Welcome back. This next dish is called green malfatti with oven-dried tomatoes, basil, and black pepper mascarpone. 
I've taken the, sun, the oven dried tomatoes that we just made and I'm cutting them in half. Now over here in the saute pan I have about a cup and a half of basic tomato sauce. The one we've made 700 times on this show and the one that you're definitely l either learning to love or learning to hate. But you can use something, that if, if you don't want to make this sauce at home, go right ahead and substitute sauce from the jar or the bottle of your favorite brand. I certainly don't want you not to make this dish because it's going to take you those extra amount of time, that ex those extra minutes to make that basic tomato sauce. So we've got the basic tomato sauce in here simmering, and you can see the carrots, you can see the garlic, you can see the thyme, and you can see the tomatoes. The reason you can only see those ingredients is because those are the only ingredients involved. Green malfatti is the pasta. Malfatti comes from the word fare. Fatto means is the past participle of the verb fare, to make. So malfatti means poorly made. Literally, just strangely shaped is what they mean. And what it'll, the, probably the main reason why this pasta was developed is because when we were making green, or I mean uh, any kind of raviolis, and you say folded it over like this, and then took a little half moon shape or a moon shape, the, the little pieces left after you cut it out, for example, if this, was a round, if this was a round ravioli or something, the pieces that you'd have left are the malfatti. And of course, any good cook's not going to throw away pasta that, spent, that they spent that time making. So malfatti probably started as something like that. But the way we make them is just any little way our whim goes. Like so, or like that, or like this. The idea being that as long as they're somewhat, they're made out of the same pasta, they're going to cook at a relatively similar time. So you just make them into zany little whimsical shapes. And that's what we've got going here. Now the sauce doesn't take much. We've got those sun, uh, oven dried tomatoes, which in their own essence are just, they're perfect. They're so simple and so good that all we've done is anointed them with a little bit of our basic tomato sauce. And now we're going to drop this pasta in. Now we've got our pasta water going over here. Of course, it's boiling at a good rate. So we're going to drop it in. Now we've seasoned the water already with salt, and you've got to make sure you do that all the time. You don't want to cook your pasta without salt in the water, because what it'll do is cause it to just, it won't give the noodle any seasoning. And the dish is the seasoning. The dish is the noodle. So now we've got our noodles going our sauce simmering, and we're going to make black pepper mascarpone. Now, if you didn't want to add this, this is certainly an optional ingredient. We're going to put a little dollop on it, and what it does, it just gives a little more zap to the uh, final dish. So instead of putting this in the blender, I've got some freshly cracked black pepper, and I've taken about a half a cup of mascarpone. If you didn't like the mascarpone, you could substitute goat cheese. You could certainly substitute a soft, creamy cheese of any, any country, but we're using the black, the mascarpone from Italy. And I'm going to put it all in. And I'm just going to give it a quick little stir. Now, that's all it takes. This is by no means any uh, Einstein of a dish at this point. We're just mixing this up together. And that's how that's going to be. Now, we've got our noodles going. And we want to make sure we boil them just like all the other fresh pastas. As I've said before, and I'll say again, fresh pastas continuously mistreated in America because people seem to think that once it's softened, it's already cooked. That's not the way it is. So let's see if I can find myself a fork here to stir it around in. And it's coming up to the boil. Now the sauce itself, if you wanted to make another variation on a theme that you could make with these perfect oven dried tomatoes, would be to make something of a pesto sauce with it. You could just take those themselves with a little bit of garlic, a little bit of pine nuts, and some extra virgin olive oil, put it in the food processor, and zap it until it resembled a tomato pesto. We also do that at Poe, but we tend to do that with uh, fresh tomatoes. But you can also do it with these oven dried, and they come out quite delicious. So now our pasta's been boiling, and it's softened, and it looks like it should. We're going to drain it carefully, and then we're going to pour it into our oven dried tomato sauce. Now there's a little bit of extra liquid there because the sauce was looking a little tight. So now what you'll do is you'll pull them out a little on the early side. The pasta is always taken out of the water on the early side. Just this side of al dente, meaning the younger or the less cooked side. And then we're going to toss them with this sauce and finish cooking this, the noodles, in the sauce. And that's a classic example of the way Italians refer to their pasta dishes 
as the noodle and the condimento, or the condiment. The sauce isn't some vat of red stuff that you're going to eventually ladle out over the top of some overcooked spaghetti like a bad Italian movie. You're going to actually cook the noodles in the sauce because that's, it, it's one dish. It's all supposed to be one thing. So we're look, as you look at the bottom of the pan, you can still see there's a little bit of liquid here, a little bit of water. We're going to continue cooking these noodles until it's tight and stuck together. And that's not very long at all. We've got it definitely on the way. Now, it's going to take a second here or so. There we go. It's just about done. So what we're going to do is we're going to add our basil. Basil you're always going to add at the very last minute. And I'm going to keep a couple leaves to sprinkle over the top because they're going to be an interesting kind of a foliage on the top. But when they cook in, what will happen is we put them in this early. We put them in this early and we want to... We want them to start to cook, and they're going to, they're going to uh, uh, acquire the cooked leaf flavor. They're not going to be like that fresh, fresh stuff. That's why I'm saving the fresh ones at the end here to sprinkle over the top. We're actually going to get the basil-y flavor in the dish as opposed to sprinkling it over the top. And we're cooking them in as I speak. Now, that is the way that should look. And as you can see, the sauce is no longer some liquidy stuff along the bottom. But it's actually starting to stick. And some of the noodles are even starting to stick. That's okay. Don't worry about those. The most important thing is that the noodles and the sauce have cooked together for several minutes. And that's what gives the dish its true Italian flavor. So now we're going to give it a quick toss. And then we're going to plate it. And that is the way you do it. You've got the oven dried tomatoes. And you want to make sure you've got enough of those with the sauce to go over the top. And these are the beautiful malfatti that we just made. We're going to garnish it with a few basil leaves, like so. But you don't want to make it look like someone laid it there. You more want it to look like it, it fell off the wind of poetry and just landed here on your plate. You don't want it to look so like someone's been working on it for a long time. And then you take a little dollop of the black, uh, black pepper mascarpone cheese, put it right there in the center, and then you invite your friends over because they're going to have a good dinner. Sprinkle a little bit of black pepper over it. And that is one heck of a pasta dish. We have green malfatti with oven-dried tomatoes and black pepper mascarpone and basil. Don't go away. We're going to have some interesting squab with unique flavors when we return. Welcome back. Now we're making grilled squab with pomegranate molasses and sautéed kale. Pomegranate molasses is a great ingredient from Lebanese kitchens that deserves a place in a lot of different kitchens. We use it at Poe to marinate our quail or our squabs, and we also use it as one of the sauces that goes around our squab or our quail. Today we're making squab, so what I've done is I've removed the backbone, and it's easy to do with some poultry shears. And then you just flatten it down a little bit and marinate it. We made a little marinade with some honey some red wine vinegar, and some paprika. What that does, the honey causes it to get that beautiful golden, dark, dark, dark brown color. The paprika adds an interesting edge of sweetness to it. The vinegar and the honey bring the whole flavor together, and it makes it really, really good. So that's, these are those squabs in the marinade. And I'm just going to put them skin side down under the grill, opening the legs, opening the thighs, that is to say, so that they continue to, they start to cook on the sides. Then we're going to season it a little bit. And we're going to let them cook. Now, a squab with the bone on will take about 25 minutes to cook, 15, 15 minutes on the first side and maybe 10 minutes on the second side. So while we're doing that, we're going to cook up our accompaniments, which is the kale that goes with it. So we've got kale here. And if you didn't like kale, you could use anything else. You could use collards. You could use escarole. You could even use just plain old ordinary romaine lettuce if you're in a pinch. All you have to do is cut it up, clean it well, because there's always, because of the convolutions of the leaves, sometimes there's going to be some sand or some dirt in it. The way you cut it up is you just cut it up thinly relatively. We're going to do about a quarter inch on the cut. And then we're going to cook it with some onions, some lemon, and a little salt and pepper. Now, we took a half of a red onion about 10 minutes ago and put it in here with olive oil. We're just going to start slowly. We caramelized them slowly, and now we're just going to add our greens. You can hear they're making popping noises. Then we're going to add our lemon zest which is the zest of one of these lemons. 
that we remove with the zester. Then we're going to add our juice. Now the juice we're going to hold off on until the very last minute because we want it to be able to retain its color. If you cook this, if you cook this with the lemon juice too early on in the game, you're going to get uh, it's going to cause the color to leach out of it really quickly. So what we want to do is we're going to season it with the lemon and the salt right before we go to the plate. So we're going to saute that, and we're going to take a look at our squabs, and you can see with the marinade where the, where the uh, grill itself is coming in contact with the marinated part of the bird, we've already got some nice dark color on there. Still, it's quite a distance away from being cooked. So we're just going to give them a flip. And actually, probably instead of cooking it for 15 minutes on the breast side down, we're going to cook it about five minutes on the breast side down, turn it over and cook it on the rib cage side here on the inside for another 10 minutes, and then finish it on the breast side down, which is what we got going up here. And they're looking pretty good. Now the kale's going, and we're going to we're going to stir it around. Now the kale here, if we'd had a full pan really really hot with oil, you could cook this kale down in about five or six minutes. At this pace, it's going to take a few more minutes than that because I've got it on relatively low heat. Try to keep as much of it in the pan as you possibly can. Now at this point, if you wanted to add a little wine or a little a little chicken stock, that would really hurry up the the cooking process because all the steam would start rising from the bottom as opposed to deriving most of your heating from the actual contact with the metal. But what'll happen in about 10 minutes, or eight minutes, I'm sorry, of slow cooking like that, is it'll start to look like that. And you can see the nice red onion. And it's already, see, you can see it's already changed color. This is what happens to green things. If I cook this another eight minutes, it's gonna be very, very dark colored. It's not gonna be as nearly as attractive. So you have to be careful when you're cooking your greens to make sure that you don't cook them until they're gray. I'd rather have them a little bit undercooked on the raw side than have them cooked hammered. And if you're going to make a mistake, always undercook them as opposed to overcook them. So we've got that kale. And it's sauteed. Now we're going to season it. Keeping in mind, once you've added this lemon juice, and when I say season, I mean the lemon juice at this point. Once you add that, you pretty much have to get it out of the pan and serve it. You don't want to let it sit here and cook with lemon juice because that's really going to leach the color out. So there's that. I'm going to season it with a little salt and pepper. And we're going to arrange it on our plate. Now the sauce that we got is this lip, uh, pomegranate molasses. You can buy it in a jar. And in pomegranate season, which is like from October to December, you can get the pomegranates and sprinkle the seeds around the plate to make it look even more attractive. But the sauce itself is exquisite. It's got a richness to it. It's not very syrupy. Well, I'll show you when I pour it out. But... Now we're going to put all that perfect kale on there. And look at how good that looks. Nice and tall. We're smoking on this grill here, that's for sure. Now you can see they've gotten a nice dark sheen. The other ones we're going to use have been cooked already. And here they are. So now you're going to arrange them. And I'll cut one. And I'll plate. Oh, he goes running off the grill. So this was for two. This could actually be appetizers for four of your friends. We're going to uh, take the knife and carve it. We're going to split the bone. Just go straight down it. Now we serve our squab medium rare to rare. And that's how I like to eat them. We'll arrange it like that on the board. Give it a little pepper. And then we're going to drizzle it with this pomegranate molasses. Again, a great Lebanese product. It's getting a little smoky over here. We pour it over and we want to make sure that we get some on the hot flesh because that's going to give a beautiful fruity fragrance up over the top as you bring the plate to the kitchen. I mean, as you bring the plate to the dining room. Then over the top, I'm going to squeeze a little bit more lemon juice and add a little bit of pepper and some more lemon zest. And that's the dish. Now that's the show. If you're interested in copies of today's recipes, you can write to the following address or you can collect them at our website. Thanks very much for watching and please join me again for more Molto Mario.